I'm explaining a film from 2016 titled The Siege of Shadowville. Spoilers ahead. Enjoy the content. The movie starts with Prime Minister Lumumba of Congo in a car. He dons his glasses, inhales deeply, then the vehicle ahead explodes. Troops surround him, drag him out, strip his blazer, and attack him. Prime Minister Lumumba receives a visit by General Moise Chambe, who is restrained and beaten. He tells Chambe that all of their people possess what is under the earth. Neither the Belgians nor the Americans own it, and neither does Chambe. That's one way to look at it, replies the other man, as he walks away. A soldier assassinates Prime Minister Lumumba. Speaking on the Congo, O'Brien makes a statement at the UN headquarters in New York. While Chambe conspires with mining firms to seize control of Katanga, he charges the countries of doing little. He emphasizes the importance of sending more peacekeepers to the area, in light of the death of Prime Minister Lumumba. We overhear Quinlan discussing Julius Caesar with a couple of his peers, in an Irish pub. Politicians do not understand tactics, and soldiers do not comprehend strategy, but Caesar mastered both. Julius Caesar is in the corner, Gorman quips in jest, pointing to Quinlan. Sniper continues, Quinlan is knowledgeable about every combat scenario and has read it all. Gorman asks how much he knows about the real deal. This time, it's Prendergast who speaks up. Quinlan is their top officer, he assures them, none of them do. Quinlan is approached by Prendergast. As they discuss the next excursion, Quinlan remarks that he doubts any of them are aware of what's happening in the world. At home, Quinlan is kissing Carmel when someone phones. He's told he's going to be sent to Jadatville with his troops. Carmel makes fun of him for being excited to go, and wants to see if he's as talented as he believes he is. He merely smiles, draws her close, and dances slowly with her. Quinlan gives a lecture to his men before leaving. He claims these are the second wave of Irish soldiers to be dispatched to Congo, and nine have already been lost. He tells them it's a great honor to be peacekeepers and they should be proud of their choice. He notes that Ireland was specifically requested to help since they had never possessed another sovereign country or sought to subjugate one. Speaking to the media, Chambe states that they are cautiously welcoming the UN soldiers. They can take care of themselves, so he says they don't know why they are in Africa, but he assures them that they would be attentive hosts. He tells them not to stir up any problem because he will teach them about Congolese customs. Hammerschold admitted receiving a phone call from Khrushchev, who reminded him of the UN's original refusal to send in troops, when Prime Minister Lumumba requested them. Kennedy also contacts him and tells that they couldn't do anything in Berlin Vietnam or Cuba, but that they believe they could calm the situation in the Congo. He personally requests that O'Brien travel to Congo, and put a stop to Chambe's pranks. Hammerschold knows that this might spark another world war, but he makes it clear that whoever stops it would be praised. He reminds O'Brien that everyone has a part to play in history and that O'Brien's occurring right now, and he gives his word that they will come up with a plan. Yes, he says. Chambe approaches General de Gaulle for assistance, worried about the deployment of UN forces. The man asks him directly what he expects in return. Chambe assures him that it is in their best interests for the mining companies to operate. Everything, even General de Gaulle's personal belongings, might be nationalized by the government if he loses power. The man promises to send a thousand of his best ex-legionnaires, who the mining firms will engage as protection but who will be under Chambe's direction. The troops arrive at a United Nations compound in Chadotville. As the troop is exposed on three approaches, overlooked from the south, and a road splits in two, Prendergast declares that calling it a compound is a joke. They are really transparent. Reminding the guys to be prepared by 6 a.m. the next day, Quinlan accepts Prendergast's observation. When O'Brien gets to Katanga, too, McIntyre and Roger run into him. Declaring that Chambe has gone too far and has to be stopped, O'Brien returns to the UN in Katanga. With great determination to retake vital structures under Chambe's control, he swiftly approves the beginning of Operation Morthor. The only troops with combat experience are Rajas, therefore O'Brien suggests that the others will turn to them to lead by example and asks that they show their resolve. Looking over their supplies, Quinlan decides it's time to buy some. Madame LaFontania boldly informs Quinlan at the shop that their group is not welcome in Katanga. He inquires as to why, and she responds the people are dissatisfied with the way things are going, particularly since Prime Minister Lumumba took office. He made a mistake, she claims, in nationalizing the minerals and driving out mining companies that had made millions of dollars for many years. Falks asks Quinlan to join him in a local tavern for a drink of French cognac. Falks queries his reason for being in Katanga when he joins him. 
Whereas Fox argues that he is defending the interests of the miners, Quinlan replies that he is defending the people from a guy who has taken power. Upon closer inspection, Quinlan learns that Madame LaFontagne is the owner of the house next to theirs. Can he contact Ireland using her phone, he asks. He corrects her, stating it's a personal call for his family, even though she has informed him it's not for military objectives, she gives him permission. Quinlan goes to thank Madame LaFontagne after finishing his conversation, and learns from her that Jadako boasts the world's largest uranium resources. He knows it's the reason they've been stationed in this particular city in the Congo. When they go back to the facility, Quinlan tells Prendergast to go to Elizabethville and alerts Mackendie of the presence of a sizable mercenary force in Jadako. Requiring reinforcements, he says. As Quinlan believes Jadotville is more remote than other UN installations and is essential to Chambe, Prendergast informs O'Brien. Prendergast alerts them to the existence of mercenaries in the city, and O'Brien says Quinlan is probably exaggerating. O'Brien is certain that the mining firm hired these mercenaries, and they would never attack a United Nations team. It will all be well shortly, he promises him. Quinlan's wish is sadly not fulfilled for Prendergast. On his walk back to the facility, he detects an increase in the number of mercenaries around them. According to Raja, his troops are attacked by a security detail, who then lock themselves in Radio Katanga. They decide to finish them out with grenades, but discover too late that there are also unarmed civilians inside the structure. That didn't happen, according to O'Brien, and it wouldn't be included in any UN reports. While viewing mass, the sniper lets out a cry that the UN soldiers are being attacked. With his machine gun drawn, Fox opens fire. Everyone must assume their designated duties, according to Quinlan. Once he's given Prendergast and the others the order to head for the south position, where there isn't an opponent in sight, Quinlan gets criticized by Cooley, who threatens to murder him. Choosing to face the mercenaries head-on, Prendergast climbs aboard a vehicle and pulls trigger. After he murders a large number of them, Falks gives the order for the survivors to escape. The day concludes with both sides planning their next onslaught. According to Falks, they were misled, since they were told that the UN soldiers were unprepared. He claims they are easy to assault, because they have never been in combat. Quinlan, on the other hand, braces himself for an all-out assault from the enemy the next time. Their remaining ammunition, only 13,000 rounds, will run out quickly, Prendergast warns them. Quinlan reports on what transpired earlier, and Mackenty finally answers. After he made the request, he chastises him for not providing encouragement. Telling Quinlan to calm down, O'Brien takes Mackenty's phone away. These mercenaries, in his opinion, are only attempting to preserve Chambe's collapsing government. Quan stops making excuses, and he mocks him. In preparation for the mercenary's second attack, Quinlan gives Sniper the order to shoot the man wearing a white suit who seems to be under Chambe's guidance. Sniper asks Quinlan whether he believes the man is significant, and Quinlan assures him that they won't have to wait long to find out. Falx observes that the man has disappeared, and commands another retreat. Falx declares a short truce and encounters Quinlan in the midst of the battlefield. When he remarks on how many there are, Quinlan replies that he sees a lot of dead people, but none of them are his. According to Falx, politicians must resolve conflicts if society is to continue. Quinlan disregards his advice and won't give up. Falx asks for a brief cessation of hostilities so that they may tend to the injured and recover the deceased. Quinlan agrees. Hegarty discovers that it's a trap, though, as a soldier is getting ready to launch a grenade with rocket propulsion. The fighting has started again. The team is battling to repel the mercenaries as they get closer. Luckily, a grenade that drops close to Quinlan does not explode. Joyce explains that it's a dud, as he prepares his own grenade, and hits one of the jeeps carrying the enemy's mortar, setting off the others. Hammerschold has now learned the identities of those killed in Radio Katanga. When he inquires about O'Brien's role, his right-hand man reminds him that O'Brien is more of an academic, who believes that everyone will wait for his decision. Although they will keep their distance from the events, Hammerschold acknowledges that they must acknowledge them. Upon inquiry from his right-hand man, Hammerschold acknowledges that they will place responsibility. During their conversation, O'Brien admits to Chambe that he wishes the fighting between Chambe's followers and the UN in Katanga would stop. The person wishes for the United Nations to recognize him as president and his government as lawful. O'Brien acknowledges that's not practical. Chambe tells O'Brien that he hasn't forgotten his fellow Irishman on the field as he leaves. The following day, Quinlan's purported reinforcements are attacked. He discovers only 30 troops were dispatched, rather than the promised battalion. 
Makini warns him these soldiers must withdraw, since they are under heavy fire from the mercenaries and are unable to advance. Quinlan questions how they're supposed to battle with their ammo depleted, and their supplies depleted. Falks, a sniper, hits him in the shoulder while he's evaluating what supplies they still have. Calling for a medic, Donnelly orders all hands to remain on the south flank. O'Brien suggests leaving those in Jadaville behind because they can't help without losing additional guys. Before they find out that Chambay's jet shot down Hammerschold's plane when it was en way to Katanga, Mackenzie engages him in combat. When the squad reaches out to Mackenzie, they don't hear back. Quinlan ultimately acknowledges that they would have helped by now if they had wanted to. Donnelly summons Quinlan's attention, and they discover a battalion of mercenaries on their way. Quinlan decides to have some of the soldiers gather their remaining mortars and cannon rounds, in order to assemble an improvised explosive. As the mercenaries move in, the troops congregate, and Quinlan gives the order to detonate the explosives, killing everyone nearby. They raid the fallen mercenaries for their weapons as another squad approaches. Enemy forces are encircling the army from every direction. Prendergast tells everyone to back off as the plane makes its way back. They've run out of ammo, someone announces. More adversaries are coming. The dust settles after a bomb goes off close to their building. The group learns that the mercenaries have disappeared and that Falks is on his way, pressuring Quinlan to complete the task. Shaking hands, Quinlan heads back to his group. All of his men respond negatively when he asks whether they wish to surrender. Conversely, Quinlan refuses to accept their choice and says that it's finished. The troops are then imprisoned, and sentenced to death. However, they are released and go home, a month later. Mackenzie greets Quinlan when they return home. He informs Mackenzie that he is nominating all of his troops for medals, for their efforts in Jadakil. Mackenzie alerts him about the forces who seek to conceal the facts about the siege, particularly in light of Quinlan's complications. When Quinlan asks how he achieved it, Mackenzie explains that he made the UN organization seem bad by giving up. The institution is harmed if the soldiers are seen as heroes. He issues a challenge to a court-martial against Mackenzie, but is informed that it would be in both his and his men's best interests. In front of O'Brien and his whole squad, he strikes Mackenzie. The other man says Mackenzie was right to leave the unit, or else there would be a global conflict, as Mackenzie makes his way back to O'Brien. The movie ends with Quinlan's unit saluting him in gratitude for his support, then he and Carmel share a tight hug. Hope you enjoyed. Do subscribe, like and comment if you'd like to see more videos like this.